This video is sponsored by Onshape. Three, two, one. This is Scout F. It's the sixth generation of Scout rockets that I've built. I started this project back in 2015 to propulsively land a model rocket. And while this flight didn't work, I'm here today to tell you about why it's closer than it has ever been. We'll do a massive recap on all of the Scout rockets at some point, but for now, today, we're just gonna talk about the current iteration of the vehicle. Scout is a 1.2 kilogram model rocket that uses two Estes F-15 rocket motors. One of them launches it and the other one ideally lands it. The big deal with this is that the landing motor has throttle control via two ceramic paddles that impinge on the plume. We'll talk about why that didn't get a chance to work in a minute. On a normal flight, the rocket should go to a blistering high 25 meters above the ground. But for this flight, we only reached about 18 meters, which is a big part of why the landing failed. During the flight, Scout tries to move over the landing pad so we can touch down softly. Right now, the landing pad is made up of some really unique aerospace grade materials that nobody else in the industry has thought to use. It's cardboard. It's actually a few things. First, I lay down a tarp and then a few layers of cardboard on top of that. On top of that goes a rug and on top of that goes a layer of mylar film. During testing with the landing legs, I found that cardboard did an excellent job of dissipating the energy on impact without making the rocket bounce. Those of you who have been around the channel for a little while will know that the bounce has been a pervasive issue. The tarp helps a bit with that too, and the carpet on top was kind of a last minute idea to just smooth out the bumps between cardboard pieces. Finally, the mylar layer on top lets the rocket slide when it touches down. Slippery surfaces make really good landing pads. Bumpy surfaces like grass or dirt let the rocket dig in and any horizontal slide on touchdown turns into a tipping moment. We didn't get to test this out much for this flight since we hit the ground pretty hard, and the mylar is clearly expendable material here, but we can focus on a more sustainable approach if we start getting more reliable landings. Uh oh. There we go, okay. The landing legs are built from carbon fiber struts that are terminated with PLA or aluminum ends. They fold out by cutting a rubber band with a nichrome wire and they lock into place with rubber bands on each strut. The load path on the legs through impact moves up through the larger strut and into an aluminum ring. Most of the high shock or high precision parts on this rocket were milled out from aluminum on my Tormach 440 mil. CNCing parts has this interesting trade-off where you can make parts that are stronger, smaller, and more lightweight than plastic in some cases if you're careful with the design. These parts also have the added benefit of being able to withstand serious impacts, so the rocket has almost no damage after a hard landing. In order to keep itself on course, the rocket also gimbals the motor using little servos, and this lets us steer it using thrust vector control. In order to try and keep things as simple as possible, we actually stack the ascent and landing motors into the same TVC mount. This has some big benefits in terms of simplicity and some very obvious drawbacks. One of the most obvious drawbacks is how much this thing wiggles on ascent. Having some wiggle in the TVC mount doesn't always mean trouble, so long as you characterize that wiggle correctly. The trick here is modeling that wiggle correctly in the flight simulation and working around it. In order to measure how the thrust vector control mount moves to any given input, I'll pop an inertial measurement unit on there, generate a bunch of data, and use some fancy tools in MATLAB to generate transfer functions which represent how the wiggle works, but here is the thing that I missed. Think about Newton's third law of motion. Every object, how did this work? Hold on. <laughs> For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. That's the one. The setup of the ascent and landing rocket motors in this thrust vector control mount is about 200 grams total, and the rocket total mass on the launch pad is 1.2 kilograms. And that means we have about 16 or 17% of our rocket's mass in this gimbaled mount. So every time this mount whips to five degrees or negative five degrees or whatever, we're taking almost 20% of the mass and moving it really rapidly. We have a lot of angular 
angular acceleration there. And the way this manifests is that as we're whipping that mount back and forth, the rocket is sort of reacting to it. And you can see it in the footage here. The rocket isn't just tilting from side to side, it's actually shimmying left to right as well. And if we take a look at the flight data on the horizontal accelerations, we can see it there as well. Talking about the wiggle in the TVC mount is probably a good segue to talking about the flight computer for the rocket, which is called AVA. AVA stands for All Vehicle Avionics, and it's the flight computer I use in most of my rockets. The AVA computer controls the entire vehicle, and as soon as the rocket leaves the pad, AVA tracks Scout's position, velocity, attitude, and a whole lot of other things. AVA uses all of that data to steer the rocket, record flight data, light the landing motor, deploy the landing legs, and it also controls a reaction wheel. This wheel and its housing were milled from aluminum, and they're driven by the cheapest 12-volt DC motor that I could find on Amazon. Controlling the roll axis of this vehicle isn't that important. It's more about making sure that the roll rate isn't that high. As long as we have a really low roll rate, it makes it very easy for the thrust vector control servos to keep up. AVA gets mounted with the flight battery on the back, and we place the telemetry antenna and GPS antenna on a carbon fiber rod to help with RF compatibility. Keeping these noisy radios away from sensitive electronics helps a whole lot in terms of accuracy in our position and velocity measurements and accuracy in our GPS data and telemetry. That whole stack gets mounted as low in the rocket as possible, and the purpose of this is to keep the CM, or center of mass, really low. A lower CM will help us not tip over on landing. But because we mount the flight computer so close to that gimbaled motor mount, that moving hardware that's slamming back and forth, all of those vibrations and shocks are going to go directly into the computer, into the inertial measurement unit, and that's going to directly affect the accuracy of all of our flight data. So like anything in rocketry, this decision comes with its fair share of benefits and drawbacks. Ultimately, on this flight, because I hadn't done a good job of characterizing how that TVC mount moves back and forth, both in terms of the angular acceleration of the mount, the horizontal shifting of the center of mass, moving all of that mass around at the bottom of the vehicle, and then the vibrations that come from the mount and go directly into the computer, all of these fancy words mean that I didn't do a good job characterizing how this thing moved, and it directly resulted in that oscillation that you see on the way up. Fixing problems like this can happen in several different ways. Some are sort of band-aids and some are more permanent fixes. No matter what approach I take here, I will have to do a better job modeling the vehicle, modeling the physics of this whole situation, and then testing on the ground to make sure it doesn't happen again. The next thing that I want to talk about here is the lower than expected apogee that the rocket reached. Scout was supposed to go to about 25 meters above the ground, but it only got to about 18 and a half meters. This one is a little bit tricky to figure out. If we take the recorded vehicle acceleration, as well as our tracked mass during flight, we can use F equals MA to get a pretty close estimate of the thrust curve of the motor. While I can spot some underperformance in this plot here, I think a solid chunk of how low our apogee ended up being comes down to how much gimbling motion we had on ascent. We're slamming that mount to plus and minus five degrees, and in some cases a little bit more than that, and we're losing a lot of the impulse that we would be spending upwards to the side. Now, because we only reached 18 and a half meters, this breaks how the landing approach is supposed to work. So we do have the ability to control the throttle of the landing motor, but it's only to a point. You can't have infinite throttle ability. It's also a solid rocket motor, so we're working with more constraints than just thrust. We have a fixed amount of burn time. One of the constraints here is that we can't land from just any arbitrary altitude. We have to sort of work within our expected flight profile with the way that I've set this up. I've mentioned 25 meters a few times, and the landing approach ideally would have let us land from 25 meters plus or minus maybe three meters. So because of the way that I'm doing this, we're generating set points on the way down of the expected altitude that we should be at if we drop from 25 meters, lit the landing motor at an ideal place, and then we plot this like little altitude curve on the way down. It's a little tricky to explain, but some plots on the screen should help explain it. In addition, because this is a solid rocket motor with a fixed burn time, we're also sort of working with the constraint that at some point this motor is going to shut off and we wanna be really close to the ground when that happens. We can close the throttle arms all the way to try and cut off as much thrust as possible, but we can never quite cut it all off. We're still gonna have maybe 20% thrust when it's fully closed. 
So the way we do this is we measure when the peak thrust of the landing motor occurs and we start generating our set points based off of that time and altitude at which it happens. This gives us a sense for what the landing curve should look like and it helps us work within that constraint of a fixed burn time. The issue with this approach is obvious given the flight you just saw. If we reach an altitude or an apogee that is much lower or much higher than we're expecting, those set points that we generate based off of a 25 meter drop we don't really have the throttle range to get back to that curve as we come back in for the landing burn. The way I'm approaching this landing burn and throttle control stuff right now is, I think, pretty hacky. I'm not sure what the right way to do this is, and of course, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, but it kinda broke. Currently, what we're trying to do is get the vehicle to follow a line that represents what it would look like if we had a fixed 80% throttle or 80% total thrust on the way down. This means that the PID controller that's looking at that set point and our actual altitude can throttle the motor up 20%, or down like 60 or 70%. I'm open to suggestions on how to approach this problem and I would love to hear some feedback on if you've worked on stuff like this, how do you do this? Uh, we have you know, some interesting constraints in terms of burn time, uh, total thrust, total impulse, but we also have some flexibility in terms of our apogee and we have to design a curve down from when we light that landing motor to the ground that gets us to the ground softly. So I'm not sure how to do this. And if this is something you have experience in, please let me know in the comments. One more fun thing to point out here is the landing accuracy, or at least the apparent landing accuracy. Our landing target was negative two meters on the Y axis, which from the tracking camera angle is just two meters to the right of the launch pad. Before the flight, I measured out two meters with my tape measure, and then I carved out long lines stemming from the landing point in the primary axis directions. This means that post-flight, we can see how accurate our touchdown position was, even with the landing pad not having markings and obscuring most of those lines. I wouldn't really count it here because we were sliding quite a bit on the z-axis. We lost a lot of position control on the way up because of how much we were wiggling. However, we did get pretty close to the landing point, within about a half meter or so. That pretty much brings it up to speed on what Scout F is and how this flight went. I am stoked to get back out to the launch pad soon. The difference between Scout F and Scout E is that this thing is built like a tank, so it should be able to get back to the launch pad really quickly, and we'll try to get another landing attempt in here soon. But in the meantime, this video was sponsored by Onshape, which is a cloud-based CAD platform for businesses. Because it's cloud-based, you no longer need a heavy hefty workstation to design and sketch up ideas. Everything happens in your browser. I'll be honest and admit that when I first started using Onshape, I was a little skeptical of how a browser-based CAD package would work, and I have to say it is really snappy. Onshape has a very responsive interface and is pretty intuitive to use. And because it's cloud-based, you're not constrained to having local files that you have to move around. You can access your designs on any computer with internet. I've created quite a bit using their platform. The Silo launched model rocket, my Falcon Heavy model, camera mounts, servos, etc. Unlike any other CAD package, Onshape rolls out new releases every three weeks with improvements and upgrades. It also has great data management built in using a GitHub inspired approach for version control so you can branch out designs without worry. Companies like Formlabs and Trek use Onshape to design their products and you can try Onshape for free by going to onshape.pro slash BPS space or clicking the link in the description down below. Thank you very much to Onshape for sponsoring today's video and thanks to you for watching. My name is Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your winds be low.